What's up guys, it's Jay back again with Tech Everything. For the last couple of weeks I've been playing around with the Biostar X370 Mini ITX motherboard and the Ryzen 7 1700. I did a build on it last week, but now I think it's time to try and go ahead and put it in my main computer, the S4 Mini, little beast running right there. And we're gonna upgrade my Intel 7700 to a Ryzen 1700. So we'll go from four cores to eight, which for my workflow is gonna be much better in terms of doing the video editing, rendering, that sort of thing. So we've got quite a few components to upgrade. The GPU is gonna stay the same, the Zotac GTX 1060 Mini. Obviously the Ryzen 1700 is the processor and the Biostar X370 motherboard. Um, upgrading the cooler from the Noctua LN9i to the LN9A. So hopefully we can get some slightly better temps there. Um, actually adding a new Samsung 850 Evo M.2 drive, so more on that later, in addition to the 960 Evo. So this will be my boot drive. I want to have faster speeds on the boots and program launches, all that fun stuff. Uh, and this will be, this is a, a Sabrent M.2 to SATA enclosure. So this is a pretty simple, straightforward. It's going to allow me to use this M.2 drive as a normal hard drive. More on that later. And this board does not have Wi-Fi. I definitely want Wi-Fi on this. It doesn't have Bluetooth either. So I picked up this Edimax Bluetooth and Wi-Fi adapter in one. It's a N150, not the fastest speeds, but this will hold me over for now until I figure out exactly what I want to do for Wi-Fi. So we're not going to go over the complete build process today. I've done two separate videos where I did a full S4 mini build. If you want to check out a full build in this case, I'll drop links below for that. Uh, but today we're just going to take a look at the new upgrade components and I'll show you the installation of them and then we'll slide into benchmarks. As I mentioned earlier, I'm gonna be upgrading my old 840 EVO scratch disc to a brand new 850 EVO M.2 drive. And you're probably wondering why I'm going with an M.2 drive and a M.2 to SATA converter instead of just getting a regular SATA drive. Really, I'm just future-proofing. There are some mini ITX boards I see coming out in the future that have multiple M.2 slots. So if I were to get one of those boards or upgrade to a new system, I would rather have an M.2 drive that I could just slide in there rather than having to stick with SATA drives. It really just makes things a lot easier. So that's the only reason I'm doing that, just in case in the future I, I want to upgrade to a different motherboard with multiple slots. So here we have the adapter and the 850 EVO. It's the exact same size as an existing SATA drive. So it's really not gonna cause any trouble. Uh, you're essentially getting the same exact experience that you would normally. And the good thing about this is it's a nice, nice metal and it's all black. So the underside will be showing in the S4 Mini and it's gonna make it look really nice actually. Installation couldn't be any simpler. You just pop off the metal top. Slide your drive in at an angle, wait for the little snap, then pop one of these screws on. Comes with a little included screwdriver too. So that's not going anywhere. Nice and secure. All right, and there you have it. Two become one, and you have a nice, now all black, except for the top here, SSD. Standard 2.5 inch, and if you need to use this drive for something else, you can pop it out, throw it on a laptop, or throw it in an external closure, or a motherboard with two slots. Nice and simple. Since my early builds, I've been using a combo of these little sticky pads with uh, pass-throughs for these mini zip ties. So you just slide it through, and then you route it like this. And this little loop essentially sticks to your case and it holds your cables in place. This is really uh, helpful in small form factor builds like I'm typically doing, uh, especially in the S4 Mini, I've been using these. The problem is, one, you've got this now ugly white block in your all, all black case, if you're using a black case. And two, once you snap this zip tie in, it can't be reused. So I've been searching for a better way, like a super simple but better way to do that. And I came up with these guys. So these are really used for 
I think automotive purposes, I think that's what they were marketed as. Um, and it's really just, it has a 3M adhesive on the back and a little arm here that snaps open and you can snap it back and reuse it. So that's, that's the best part about this. You can reuse these and put them throughout your case and hold wires and they're black and sleek and fairly low profile. So it's gonna be pretty difficult for people, people to see them, but they should clean up any small form factor build that, that you're doing. Since in the Mini, the underside of your SSDs will be showing, I'm going to take the back sticker off of my 850 Evo. It's been something that's been bothering me for a while now, and I'm finally gonna go ahead and just remove it. Okay, now I'm just gonna use a little alcohol and cotton ball to Clean it up. It doesn't look so crappy. Now after a little elbow grease, you see a nice clean bottom that we won't be able to see any white letters from the top of the case. All good. So we're not gonna do a full build video. I've done that twice already. I'll link to the older builds if you wanna see the build process inside an S4 Mini. But I just wanna give you a quick layout of the components. So you have the 500 gig, the new one, and then the older one here with the Noctua NHL9A rather than the NHL9I and the HD Plex 160. This is the version one of the HD Plex 160. Underneath, you will see the GTX 1060 right there as well, the Zotac Mini version. Now I'm using the HD Plex 160, but there's also the newer HD Plex 160, the version two. You see the cables come out of the sides instead of the back like this one. There's no uh, cable box, modular cable box, just regular four pin connectors there. Uh, and the wiring is all black. So that's just really nice. As you can see here, you've got wires that are white or yellow and black and red and black um, over there. So it's really a much improved unit and I will be incorporating this in the future. Just need to test it out and stuff and see how everything works. But just let just so you guys know, if you go to the HP Plex site, this is what you'll see, this is what you'll find. Uh, no longer this older version. So now I have everything all assembled, a fresh copy of Windows 10 installed. Let's take a look at temps. I'm gonna do some synthetic benchmarks and then we'll do some gaming benchmarks after that. You will see on the charts, first the stock settings, which is all cores boosted to 3.2 gigahertz. That's the default setting for the Ryzen 1700. And then you will see a modest overclock to 3.625 gigahertz. So you'll see both results on each chart uh, for each temp and each test. Now, I know a lot of you are thinking, oh, why didn't you go higher, 3.9, 4.0, uh, push it higher? Well, in a case this compact with a low profile cooler, at some point you start seeing diminishing returns in terms of uh, A, power usage, and B, temperatures. So I found that 3.625 at 1.275 volts was really the sweet spot for the S4 Mini in terms of temps and performance. I was getting really good performance along with very, very manageable temps. So taking a look at the temps, you can see the idle temps for stock and overclocked are the same because when you use Ryzen Master to overclock, it maintains the boost profile. So it will ramp up to that speed rather than just staying consistently at 3.625 like it would if you did a BIOS overclock. But overall, cooling the CPU with the Noctua NH-L9A was not a problem, especially at stock. It didn't go over 75 degrees, which was incredible. Uh, for all eight cores, 16 threads to be running at less than 80 degrees was pretty impressive. Even when overclocked, I wasn't hitting 85, I was hitting around 81, 82. So that, those are really good results, uh, really comfortable temperatures. And that was using Prime 95 for the stress testing. So ideally in, in a normal situation, under normal workload, you'll never see anything even close to that. Taking a look at the synthetic benchmarks, you'll see that overclocking the Ryzen 1700 does not give a huge bump in gaming performance, but 
when you start talking about compute tasks, that's where you see a massive increase. Take a look at the Cinebench score from 1403 to 1571. That's free performance and it's, it's real world performance. When you start getting into performance of programs like Premiere Pro and, and rendering that sort of thing, those are real world results that you will get from that kind of boost. So as other people have said, if you're looking at a chip like this, really you need to take into account the kind of workload that you will have. If you're a heavy gamer, Intel four core parts are still gonna be better for you, but if you do any kind of mixed workload or, or any sort of rendering, uh, 3D modeling, any anything like that, uh, video creation, content creation, this chip is simply amazing. So sliding over to some games, I left the CPU overclocked and you see some very, very respectable scores in terms of performance for 1080p gaming on high settings of these titles. I will add some more titles to the article on the website later on if you want to see some more gaming benchmarks. But as you can see, you have no problem playing AAA titles at 1080p high settings. Uh, pretty much any game you should be fine in that ballpark. And a lot of games at 1440p you will be able to play at 60 frames per second. If you're looking for 120 frames or 120 hertz, that's, that's probably not the setup for you. There are better options for sure. But at 1080p, 60 frames, you're good to go. So overall, I am really happy with these upgrades. The 960 EVO is flying much faster than my older Intel 600P. The upgrade to my scratch disk has been a good move. I'm also storing all my Steam games and you know random installs like Cinebench and benchmarking stuff on that secondary drive. So if I do have to reinstall Windows, test something out, it's not an issue. I don't have to keep reinstalling all this crap over and over again. So that's a really nice upgrade. And the CPU, the 1700, has been really impressive. I'm super impressed with Ryzen. I've been an Intel guy for the last 10 years or so. I haven't had, an, I don't think I've ever actually had an AMD processor. So this is my first and I'm really happy with it. Rendering is much faster. Actual performance in the programs I use, you know, Premiere Pro, After Effects, that's much faster as well. If you're thinking about upgrading to Ryzen, I'm a fan. Obviously, I switched my personal rig to the 1700. If you're a hardcore gamer, still a 7700K or even some of the new X299 stuff that's coming out is going to be a little better for you. Uh, but at this price point, at $300, you get this much performance out of a CPU, you really can't beat it. The only thing that I'm not really super thrilled with is the motherboard in here. As soon as a new Mini ITX motherboard comes out, I will definitely be upgrading. So as always guys, thanks for watching. I will drop links below for all the items you saw in this video, as well as a link to the article on the website if you wanna learn some more information and see benchmarks as I add them to that article. Please like, comment, and subscribe if you like the video. I'm Jay, this is Tech Everything, and I'll see you next time.